So thank you very much, Michael uh, and Laura and colleagues for inviting me to give this lecture and for giving me the opportunity to return to Edinburgh University, which is my alma mater, and speak in such beautiful surroundings. It's particularly lovely to be afforded that opportunity by young law graduates of the faculty that I also attended, although that does seem rather a long time ago. It's almost exactly five years since I gave up my legal career to enter the world of politics when I was selected by the SNP as the candidate to fight Edinburgh South West in the 2015 general election. And the transition from law to politics has not been without its challenges. I often say that when I retire, I'm going to write a memoir of my first six months of being a member of Parliament. And rather than being called the dream shall never die, it will be called will the nightmare never end. <laughs> because I found it a very difficult transition um, initially. And that this was so was actually foreseen by one older advisor member of the SNP in Edinburgh South West who, who came up to me at the candidate selection hustings in the Western Hills Education Centre and said to me, oh hey, I feel so sorry for you. You've spent most of your life in one hated profession, and now you're moving to an even more hated profession. <laughs> and uh, but you know, she was quite right, because I, um, I don't really feel that I ever left the world of law, uh, because politics and the law have become very intertwined uh, as a result of the constitutional crisis which has arisen, the multifaceted constitutional crisis which has arisen as a result of the Brexit vote back in 2016. And in the Article 50 case led by Andy Whiteman, my friend from the Green Party, who Michael mentioned at the beginning, and also in the prorogation case, the role of the courts, and particularly the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom and the European Court of Justice, were very pivotal at key moments of the Brexit process. And I'm very proud, um, as a Scots lawyer, that the decision of the European Court in Luxembourg in the Article 50 case and the decision of the UK Supreme Court prorogation case were decisions that were very much uh, made in Scotland and made in the Scottish courts. And now, of course, the debate about how we go about holding a second independence referendum that will be legally valid and properly constituted also involves uh, legal considerations, and I'll, I'll say a bit about that later. This year, 2020, we're going to be celebrating the 700th anniversary of the declaration of our growth. I think this is a very timely reminder to us that when a second independence referendum is held, Scotland will not be voting to secede from England, but rather to cease a 300-year-old union between two nation states. And Scotland will not be voting to become independent for the first time. Scotland will simply be voting to resume the statehood which it held for many hundred years after the declaration of our growth, before the Act of Union. And I mention this because I don't think this is something that is particularly well understood out with Scotland. And I find very much when I'm speaking to politicians from fellow, well, no longer fellow EU member states, but from the 27 EU member states that remain, with perhaps the exception of the Irish who are much closer to our situation, there isn't always a very clear understanding that Scotland voting to be independent is not comparable to Yorkshire deciding to leave England, for example, but rather the decision to break a, a centuries old union of two existing states. And of course, later this year, we'll also be marking the sixth anniversary of the 2014 independence referendum. And uh, it's hard to believe it's six years, but on the other hand, it's been a very, very busy six years at a time during which the debate about Scottish independence and Scotland's future has been quite significantly changed by the hard reality of Brexit. Because the United Kingdom that so many of my fellow Scots wanted to remain part of in 2014 doesn't really exist in the same form anymore. Labour have suffered their worst defeat for decades so the much heralded dawn of international socialism from the Silly Isles to the Shetland Isles seems to be dead for at least another decade, if not a generation, whatever that means these days. <laughs> and after 10 years of hamstrung Tory governments, the coalition government, 
Cameron's Green government, which was dominated by the Brexit vote, and then the uh, Theresa May's minority administration, we're looking now at probably 10 years of a majority government from a Tory party, which has espoused a very extreme position, has a huge majority, and has become such an extreme party that it no longer has room for the likes of Kenneth Clark, Dominic Green, and Amber Rudd. Now, during the 2014 independence referendum, the thought that Boris Johnson would become the resident in number 10 Downing Street, I think, was really unthinkable. And for many people, the thought that Britain would actually choose to leave the European Union was unthinkable. But both those things have come true, and I think both those things change very significantly the nature of the United Kingdom going forward. But of course, the overwhelming majority of Boris Johnson and his party is a majority made in England. And in Scotland, my party writes high in the polls and keeps winning elections rather emphatically. And the last three opinion polls on the question of independence have shown a majority for yes, albeit a narrow one. For me, there's still much work to be done until what is for me a dream, that is the possibility of Scottish independence, can be realised. But I appreciate that for other people living in Scotland, independence is not so much a dream as a possible escape route from the current nightmare of Brexit Britain. And it's an escape route, the merits of which they are of which the merits of which they're yet to be convinced. So for me, whereas independence is a dream, for other Scots it's not a dream, it's something they're interested in, but they're yet to be convinced of its merits, and therefore I think it's incumbent upon people like myself to explain now in some detail why we think Scotland's future would be best served as an independent nation in the European Union, and how we propose to get there. And so that's what I'm going to try to do a little this afternoon. I think the central starting point in the case for Scottish independence in the European Union is that the Brexit process has illustrated the limits of de-illusion. And it's also provided a very sharp contrast between the way in which small nation member states of the United Kingdom are treated and small nation member states of the European Union are treated. And I know that my colleagues in the Scottish Government have looked on with envy as the concerns of the Irish Government their very valid concerns were placed centre stage in Brussels during the Brexit process, while Scotland's concerns and the concerns put forward by the Scottish Government on behalf of people in Scotland were ignored or derided at Westminster. And I do think it's instructive just to review some of the key political events for Scotland on the last five and a half odd years since the independence referendum. If you'll remember, I was one of 56 SNP MPs elected in the general election that followed the independence referendum. And we all went down to Westminster. 56 out of 59 seats in Scotland were held by my party. Yet, when the British Parliament came to enact the Scotland Bill, which was, due, which was designed to deliver the promises that had been made about more powers for the Scottish Parliament, not one single amendment proposed by the SNP to that bill was accepted. Now I think that's a very stark illustration of the democratic deficit that the representatives of the Scottish electorate suffer at Westminster. Then of course came the Brexit vote, which was won by a small margin across the United Kingdom, whereas the Scotland voted by 62% to remain, and in Northern Ireland I think I'm right in saying by 55% to remain. Yet in drawing up her red lines for the negotiation, Theresa May gave no consideration whatsoever to the fact that two out of the four constituent parts of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland had voted to remain. There was no reaching out to the administration, to, to the administration in Edinburgh and to representatives in, in Northern Ireland, and there was no attempt at coalition building. Then, of course, very early in the process of Brexit, my colleagues in the Scottish Government put forward a paper called Scotland's Place in Europe, which contained proposals 
far a compromise that you will either differentiate a deal for Scotland or a compromise, a soft Brexit arrangement for the whole of the United Kingdom. And it was very well received in Brussels. I know Michelle Barney read it from cover to cover. But it was almost immediately rubbished at Westminster and thereafter ignored. And the Scottish government were cut out of the Brexit negotiations. Then, of course, we had the European Union withdrawal bill, which required a legislative consent motion. The Scottish Parliament voted against giving the bill legislative consent with huge cross party support. Everyone in the Scottish Parliament voted against giving it legislative consent, apart from one Lib Dem and the Conservative Party. But that withholding of legislative consent was ignored. And it subsequently became very clear that putting the Sewell Convention on a statutory footing in the Scotland Bill was worthless, and the heads forward of the Sewell Convention is going to be honoured more in the breach than in the observance. And indeed, the UK Supreme Court have told us that putting it on a statutory footing made no difference whatsoever, and it's merely a convention which can be ignored as a matter of political reality. Then you may remember, remember that the Scottish Parliament uh, passed its own legal continuity bill dealing with the consequences of Brexit for devolved laws and legislation. And after the bill was passed by the Scottish Parliament by a significant cross-party majority, it was challenged by the British government in the Supreme Court. And while that legal challenge was pending, waiting to be heard, the Tories introduced amendments in the House of Lords to retrospectively change the Scotland Act in order to render large parts of the continuity bill ultra wise And when those amendments uh, came back to the floor of the Commons, we were afforded only 19 minutes to debate the implications of those, of those amendments for Scottish devolution, with all the time being taken up by a government minister. And you may remember that was what prompted the walkouts by, uh, led by my colleague, the leader of the Westminster Group, Ian Blackford. And of course, the Supreme Court went on to find that the continuity bill had been largely within the power of the Scottish Parliament at the time it was passed, but these retrospective amendments had rendered a large part of it uh, ultra virus. It's become commonplace in the House of Commons to see Scottish National Party MPs shout it down when they rise to speak. Now, I'm not standing on my personal dignity about that. What annoys me about it is that I am there not to speak merely for the SNP, but to speak for the people who elected me, and therefore it's not appropriate that the government benches should attempt to silence me or any of my colleagues when we get up to speak. And there's also been a, sil a silencing recently in relation to the Scottish media, which I believe has huge implications for freedom of the press, when the Scottish lobby journalists, the Scottish media at Westminster, found themselves excluded from a major briefing on Brexit at uh, number 10, and the junior minister came to the floor of the house to tell us all that this was perfectly okay. Right about the same time, the same week that that happened, the Scottish media were excluded from briefings at Downing Street. The somewhat comical, evil procedure in which votes for English laws was applied to the NHS funding bill. And Scottish MPs' votes weren't counted, despite the fact that the Deputy Speaker and the Chair admitted that the bill had Barnet consequentials. Now, I could go on and on with the list of <coughs> things that have occurred in the last five years that indicate, I think, to the fairest observer that there is a democratic deficit at, at Westminster for Scotland. Perhaps one of the most obvious ones has just happened in the past 10 days when the Scottish Government's proposals for a Scottish visa and some limited devolution of immigration powers to Hollywood after Brexit were dismissed out of hand within an hour of their being published. Now this happened despite the fact that Michael Gove promised during the Leave campaign that there would be some devolution of immigration powers to Scotland as a result of Brexit. But perhaps more importantly than Michael Gove's promise, which I would suggest should only be treated with a pinch of salt, these uh, immigration uh, devolution proposals were supported in Scotland by the Federation of Small Business, the Scottish Council for Development and Industry, the STUC, the Scottish Trade Union Congress, the Law Society of Scotland, the David Hume Institute, and the Royal Society of Edinburgh. 
yet they weren't even worth the time of reading by the British government. And of course, the final withdrawal act, which has affected Brexit and allowed Brexit to happen, Hollywood also withheld its legislative consent to that, and that was ignored. So the reason I list these events is to say that the Brexit process has told us a lot about the reality of devolution, and it has confirmed, if it were ever in doubt, that power devolved is power retained. <coughs> that Scotland doesn't need the UK as we were promised in 2014, but must rather follow where England wishes to go, <coughs> whether we like it or not. And if, I suggest to you, the United Kingdom was the Union of Equals that um, we were told it was in 2014, then we would not have suffered this series of slights that I have just set out. And I was at a, a talk in London a couple of years ago by the former Taoiseach of the Republic of Ireland, John Bruton, and he was asked by somebody in the audience, not me, somebody else, uh, to comment on Scotland, the treatment of Scotland during the Brexit process. And he said that Scotland's marginalisation within the United Kingdom is not something that could happen to a member state of the European Union. And that if the European Union were taking a decision as drastic as Brexit, and it had only four nations in it, all four nations would need to agree before that course of action was followed. But in the UK, it doesn't matter what Scotland and Northern Ireland say, their desire can always be overridden by the English vote. And that's not an anti-English comment, it's just a comment on the current state of the British Constitution. By contrast, if Scotland was a member state of the European Union, even though we are a country of only 5.5 million, we would have the same veto as Ireland and other small member states over such a major decision and the same veto as a bigger member state would have. And I think when looked at that way, it's hard not to see that the European Union seemed rather a more attractive union for Scotland to be part of than the United Kingdom. At all events, uh, one thing that has perhaps united many of those of us who were on the other opposite sides of the uh, independence referendum in 2014 was our desire to try and keep the whole of the United Kingdom in the European Union. And uh, politicians from both sides of the divide joined together to do that. But that fight has now lost at UK level. All possible routes for the United Kingdom to remain in the European Union have been exhausted, and the UK has left the European Union. It doesn't quite feel like that because we're in the transition period, but we are no longer a member state. <coughs> And the only route back to EU membership for Scotland is via independence. And of course, it's been quite well reported that the attitude of the European Union has changed towards the idea of Scottish independence and Scottish accession to the EU. People as important as Donald Tusk have indicated that Scotland would be welcome, and respected commentators have argued that for Scotland, the accession process could be relatively quick and easy. So against this background, I think it's the constitutionally responsible thing for, to do for Scottish politicians and Scottish society to discuss Scotland's constitutional future and to discuss the prospect of independence. But this need not preclude my colleagues at Hollywood from addressing challenges in domestic policy. You can do both at the same time. You can deal with domestic policy and look at the bigger constitutional and international picture at the same time. And in any event, I don't believe the road to independence needs to be, or in fact should be, the sole preserve of the Scottish Government or the Scottish National Party. The commentator Robin McAlpine at the Commonweal Think Tank has pointed out that what connects the successes of the anti-Thatcher campaigns in Scotland in the mid-80s, the anti-poll tax campaign, the Scottish Constitutional Convention, and the 1997 devolution referendum, and also the surprising gains of the independence movement in 2014, albeit that we didn't win the referendum. What connects all of these campaigns is that they were fought by coalitions, coalitions of the politically active and coalitions of people 
who were not politically active, and none was led by a single party leader. And that's why many of us who are keen to live independence for Scotland eh, are keen to reach out beyond the political tribes. So I very much welcome the First Minister's announcement of her intention to set up a constitutional convention. She has suggested that MPs, MPs, MSPs and council leaders should be invited to it. I believe this membership should also include civic society, particularly the trade unions, but also members of the many grassroots organisations that have sprung up in Scottish politics, in, in Scottish political and civic life, mainly as a, a spin-off from um, the uh, independence referendum. I also welcome the policy papers promised by the First Minister when she gave her speech on Brexit Day. When I was out on the doorstep of Edinburgh South West campaigning to be re-elected at the end of last year, I met many people who told me that they would be voting SNP, that they liked our stance on Brexit, but they were yet to be convinced of the case for independence. And many of them made it very clear to me that they were open to persuasion, that they had questions which they felt had not yet been adequately answered. And so far as I can see, these questions revolve around three broad issues. The economic case for independence, a concern about which currency we would use and a fear that we might be forced to use the euro before we were ready to do so. Concerns about how the process of accession to the European Union will work and concerns about how we might avoid a hard border with England in the event that Scotland and the European Union and England chooses to distance itself far from the single market and the custom union. And these are all legitimate questions. I think the answers already exist, but the answers need to be packaged and articulated to voters in a way that is easily digestible. Now, I think the answers already exist because much work has already gone into answering these questions. For example, uh, from the Sustainable Growth Commission set up by the First Minister, and also the work done by the Scottish Government in Scotland's place in Europe. There's also a wealth of research and commentary flowing from our great universities, such as this one, and also from think tanks in Scotland, uh, such as the Scottish Centre for European Relations. On accession to the EU, as I've said, there's been a sea change in the attitude of Europe since the days of the Barroso Commission. We all heard what Donald Tusk had to say last weekend when he expressed his view that there would be enthusiasm and empathy for an application for membership from an independent Scotland. But he was, of course, also very careful to emphasise the requirement for the treaties of the European Union to be obeyed and formalities to be observed. But I think it's fair to say that what I believe was the nonsense of suggesting that an independent Scotland would go to the back of the queue and be in a comparable situation to the Balkan states has been knocked on the head by more than one expert commentator. And in fact, in a paper published by the Scottish Centre for European Relations today, Professor uh, James Carroll Lindsay, who's written extensively on Scot Southeast Europe and succession and recognition in international politics, he argues that an independent Scotland would leap the EU membership candidates from the Balkan states and join the European Union relatively quickly. And he's not alone in that view. On the issue of border checks between Scotland and England, I believe that there is work to be done, and in particular work to be done de-dramatising this issue. The First Minister spoke about this in her speech in Brussels last week, when she spoke about Scotland mitigating the effects of such a, such a border. And I think it's very important that the public discourse appreciates that such a border would involve checks for goods, but not people, because of the common travel area. So no question of people being called to the mass for their passport they decided to nip over the border to have afternoon tea in Berwick. <laughs> I also think we need to understand the question of a hard border in this context. The extent to which there will be a hard border will very much depend on the extent to which England chooses to diverge from the European Union and operate an isolationist trade policy. And I think it's at least rather curious that the British government seems so adamant that, that, there, that there will be no checks or controls on the border between the United Kingdom and the island of Ireland, which they've agreed to as a result of the withdrawal agreement, but yet they 
would have to be a hard border with an independent Scotland. Such blatant inconsistency should not go unchallenged, and I'm sure it will be firmly challenged in the policy papers to be issued by the Scottish Government. Now, finally this afternoon, I want to say something about the issue of how we in Scotland might go about securing an independence referendum which would be legally valid and the results of which would be recognised internationally. First of all, particularly if there are any journalists in the audience, I want to make it crystal clear that I've never advocated a wildcat or an, what some people call an illegal referendum. I think it would be more than a little surprising if I were to do that, given my legal background and the fact that I spent, spent so much of last year uh, litigating in the Scottish courts and the Supreme Court uh, against the effects of unlawful action taken by the British Prime Minister. So I'm not interested in a wildcat or a legal referendum. We could spend some time discussing what a wildcat or a legal referendum is, and we could also spend some time discussing the very significant constitutional differences between Scotland and Scotland's position in the UK and Catalonia's position in Spain. But I'm not going to do that this afternoon. I'm going to look just at the Scottish position. Ideally, I'd like to see an independence referendum take place under the same circumstances as pertained in 2014 when Alex Salmond and David Cameron reached the Edinburgh Agreement, an agreement between two governments on the proper lawful basis for the referendum and an agreement to respect its results. However, reaching such an agreement is dependent on the largesse of Boris Johnson. And frankly, a bold no from him was to be expected, particularly given the likelihood that those in favour of independence will probably win the next referendum. I think it's fair to say that no Conservative and Unionist Prime Minister would want to be the one on whose watch Scotland left the Union. And it would be even more ignominious for Boris Johnson to be in that position, because Scotland had a lawful referendum, then we could be in for a very long wait. So I think it's comforting to think that his position may be unsustainable, but at best that's a hope. And it's my belief that that hope should not prevent us from looking at what other leverage we have in the meantime. I've tried to argue this afternoon that the struggle for constitutional change in Scotland needs to be multi-dimensional. We shouldn't waste our time battering against just one defence. And the Constitutional Convention that was announced by the First Minister and the policy papers that are to be delivered by the Scottish Government are two parts of what is a multifaceted approach to constitutional change. But I suggest that we might explore a third strand in which, to use the words of the First Minister, we test the legal case that it might be within the competence of the Scottish Parliament to hold an independence referendum. The arguments that the Scotland Act could be construed in such a way as to allow for Hollywood to hold an independence referendum are well established. They go back to 2012, before the Edinburgh Agreement was achieved, when seven leading uh, constitutional and public law academics, including three professors, published a paper challenging the view that only Westminster has the authority to call an independence referendum. And recently, one of the authors of that paper, my friend and uh, former student of this university also, Professor Amy McCarg, and her senior colleague, Christopher Corkendale, have reaffirmed the view that it's not clear that one of them doesn't have the power to hold an independence referendum. And, and they said as follows, although it's frequently asserted that a referendum on independence falls by with default competence, that issue has never been conclusively settled. And uh, my friend and senior counsel in the Article 50 and provocation cases, Aidan O'Neill QC, has produced a detailed opinion setting out the arguments why he believes that Hollywood does have the power to hold such a referendum. So I think it's fair to say there are some legal academics in this view, but I think it's fair to say that the balance, the weight of legal opinion, is that the answer to the question is not clear and is open to being tested. So how would we go about doing that? Well, if the Scottish Parliament was to pass a bill making provision for the holding of an independence
kind of check record. I believe the matter would end up before the courts. It's not hard to see it being the subject of a legal challenge, if not by the United Kingdom through its law officer and the Advocate General who challenged the legality and competence of the continuity bill, then I see it being challenged by a third party with an interest in seeing such a referendum halted. Perhaps, for example, Scotland in the Union or some other pro United Kingdom organisation. As regards challenges or referrals to the Supreme Court by law officers, under Section 33 of the Scotland Act, within the period of four weeks of the passing of any bill, the Advocate General, who is the British Government's law officer for Scotland, the Lord Advocate, the Scottish Government's law officer, or the Attorney General, that's the English law officer, may refer the question of whether a bill or any provision of the bill could be within, is within the legislative competence of the Parliament to the Supreme Court for a decision. And such a referral wouldn't have to be by the Advocate General, the UK Government's law officer, it could be done by a Scottish Government law officer. There's precedent for following this route in cases that have been referred to the Supreme Court by the law officers in the Welsh and Northern Irish devolved jurisdictions. So there are a number of routes by which any bill passed by Holyrood could end up before the courts, and I'm reasonably sure that it would. And I'm reasonably sure it would go all the way to the Supreme Court, if not going directly there. In that event, it would be ultimately for the courts and ultimately for the Supreme Court to decide whether the bill that had been passed by Holyrood was within the competence of the Scottish Parliament and whether the independence referendum that bill purported to authorise could proceed. And they'd do that by a process of statutory interpretation, arguments about what the Scotland Act says and the arguments that have been put forward by the legal, legal academics to whom I refer and also by Amy O'Neill no doubt be employed. And as I said, I'm pretty sure the case would ultimately end up in the UK Supreme Court. Now, if they found the bill to be within the competence of the Scottish Parliament, we would then have a lawfully constituted referendum. And one which I believe it would be hard for unionists to boycott in the knowledge that the United Kingdom Supreme Court had said that it was a lawful referendum. On the other hand, if we were to lose such a case, I don't believe that we would be any further back than we are now. And I would expect the United Kingdom Supreme Court to make some comments about a constitution which doesn't allow the second independence referendum to be held, despite the fact that the Scottish Parliament has voted to hold one. The party that wants one keeps winning elections and the polls show the majority of Scots would like one to be held and now favour independence in the wake of Brexit. So, to conclude, I am very far from suggesting that there's any shortcut to an independent Scotland through litigation. But I do think the courts could play a role in determining whether or not Hollywood has the power to hold a referendum determining our constitutional future if Boris Johnson continues to say no. The benefits of EU membership have been very, very well rehearsed in the years since the EU referendum. And in a way, it's a shame they weren't as well rehearsed in the run-up to the EU referendum. But I think they have been well rehearsed now. And most of us are far better informed about the benefits of EU membership than they were before we voted in 2016. And I think it would be fair to say that the Scots were given the chance to vote on that issue again before becoming a higher majority than 62%. But the arguments that now need to be looked at, the arguments that now need to be properly rehearsed, for those of us who want to win the argument for Scottish independence, those are the arguments about how Scotland goes forward in the changed circumstances that follow Brexit. And I believe that those arguments must focus on the issues that I've outlined today. The economic argument for independence, the way in which Scotland would accede to the and also the problem of the border between Scotland and England. 
and central to the strategy of winning independence must be providing clear, digestible answers to those questions, which are asked repeatedly by my fellow Scots and fellow people living in Scotland who have yet to be convinced of the case eh, for independence. And of equal importance to answering those questions is building a broad coalition of support. Now, I know many activists in the Yes movement have been working on this for years, and it's to be hoped that the Constitutional Convention announced by the First Minister can build on their work, consolidate it, but move the arguments in the, the discussion on from out with those of us already convinced of the arguments for yes into broader Scottish civic society. I believe that, that if that is done, the argument is there to be won. But the case must be advanced with facts and evidence-based arguments, and we must also employ respect and statecraft. If that is done, then I'm confident Scottish independence will work.